You know, the, um, I don't really like to glorify the enemy. You know what I mean? Anybody understand that? <laughs> Just see if y'all wait. So, he's not powerful. But he is persistent. And, you know, if we, this is not my message tonight, but if we really understood the spirit realm, we would forget the, the thought that it's Satan. But we would absolutely be clear on that it is demonic activity that we're against. I don't know if I made that cloudy or clear, but we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places and the rulers of darkness of this world. We do war against evil spirits or, or satanic or evil entities. But they're not all Lucifer or Satan. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. I'll tell you what, their determination to stop the kingdom of God is strong. And it ain't my message, but I want you to know something. The reason it is this way, have you ever thought why in the world we're in this? I do. You know, y'all have heard me for a while here at the church. I'm always thinking of the big picture because it's got to make sense, and it does. Because you and I, like I was talking about last week, are made in the image of God. The fallen angels, the disembodied spirits, which are demons, and Lucifer, Satan, in every negative or evil cohort that's out there, is hell-bent on you not becoming a manifested son of God. And I mean to tell you that the temptations, the trials, the attacks, all of that is a planned assignment to keep you caught up in the negative, knocked down in the depressive, overcome in the traumatic, or just discouraged in the current. So a lot of times when the church is sleeping, I ain't talking about in your bed, I'm talking about we're not engaged. The enemy don't sleep. <clears throat> Let me tell you one reason. Glad the Holy Ghost gave us, you know, put this on me to talk about because I wasn't thinking about it at all. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is coming back for a church that is glorious. Listen, Father is in heaven monitoring everything. That's why he knew in the time of Noah that the hearts of men were on evil continually. And it was that way for hundreds of years before he brought judgment. Go into that timeline sometime, maybe in the future, but it's irrelevant tonight. <clears throat> and so, Father is up there looking, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is ready. Y'all know when Jesus got ready to return? The moment he got there. Because <laughs> you got to understand, he's been crowned king set at the right hand of the Father in the position of power and authority over what? Over the earth. Never tells us he's got authority over his Father in heaven. He's got authority here. God said that this would be his inheritance. He paid the ultimate price for it. He redeemed it. Amen. 
So Jesus is ready to go, and Father said, you're going to wait a minute. I'll tell you when. Jesus told his disciples like this. He said, the day and the hour, no man knows, not even the Son of Man, only the Father himself. Father's waiting till he sees his church at the right place. Why? Because the Word of God's got to be fulfilled. And we're not walking yet in what he says we will walk in. We're not. Because the last time I read, Jesus said the works I do, these and greater will you do. Amen. So the church has been hanging out in darkness. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is, that, is that there is truth that can penetrate our current mindset or circumstances where we will see beyond in what God's really wanting to do. Listen to me. Y'all know what one of the biggest, I said this talking to Casey on the phone earlier today, y'all know what one of the biggest warnings we got in the Bible about the last days was what would be in the earth? Deception. He said except the days would be short and the very elect would be deceived. So we got to watch ourselves and say, am I seeing clearly or am I being deceived? Because listen, when we talk about deception, all deception is is a wrong perception. Deception is the lack of preception. Pre is the ability to see before what it truly is. Deception is believing what you've seen before. I'm glad that's recorded. <clears throat> because, listen to me, I look at myself and I say, Father, there's something I don't see. Listen, we're not always in a, in a situation where we're not heaven bound. I say that all the time, that people won't think I'm preaching something that says you're not saved, full of the Holy Ghost, a child of God, a son of God, uh, the righteousness of God. That is not the point. The point is what we can be. What we can be. And in that glorious church, I love this because he said this. He said, in that church there will be no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So when you look at that in context, or in the, you know, study that verbiage of spot, that is literally a blemish or a stain. That is something that is tainting the robe of righteousness but we believe it can't be removed. We've just grown accustomed to it. That's just a habit I got. And God said, no, I'm looking for a people who says, ain't nothing I can't change. A wrinkle, a wrinkle is literally that. A wrinkle is literally like a pleat in a curtain. And he said, a wrinkle is that which you have covered up, but it's still there. He said, I'm looking for a people that don't make excuses, but they say, Father, this is really who I am, how I feel, what I think, and what I've done. And he says, now I can deal with that. I don't need your self-righteousness. I need you to want to be like me. Father, don't throw us away in our worst moment, church. So I'm preaching the opposite of condemnation. I'm telling you, Father knows we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Father wants you to not come short and fulfill and manifest the glory of God. Amen. So when we've fallen short, the Bible said that a fool will fall seven times, but he'll stay down seven a wise man will fall seven, but he'll get up seven. A wise man. It'd be wise on your worst day if you just get back up and do it again. You know, live for God. Just say, I'm not stopping. I ain't perfect. Father, forgive me. I'm going on. Remember this here, that everything that God has deposited in you is not derailed, wasted, or forfeited because you sin. 
The deposit's still there. You just found your flaw. You just found a weakness. You just found a disobedience. You just, you know what I mean? Not belittling your sin. But again, repentance is acknowledging and knowing I did wrong. But Father God, I see I can do it right. And with your help, I'll go forward. So we must go forward. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> so, so, see if I can actually get to the, to the Bible here. I was right where I wanted to be a while ago. I'm thinking of, uh, here's what I wanted to say by the Holy Ghost. I asked the Lord today this. I've got something, you know, I'm going to continue teaching from last week, but I want you to hear this by the Holy Ghost. Me and my wife were talking. I ain't going to tell you everything that was said. It wasn't that much said. It was very few words. I could tell you in one sentence probably. But we connected on, on the same thought about, Father, what are you doing? And here's the thing, church, is that a few weeks ago I was talking about confusion. And I say confusion because the Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2. You know, in verse 1 it says, How God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 it says, And it was without form and void. And that verbiage there literally means that it became without form and void. The word form and void, without, means to set in disarray or, or decay because it's in disarray, out of order. And so years and years ago, a long time ago, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and he said, when your life is in confusion, everything that you need is available. It's just out of order. It's in the wrong place. So sometimes confusion comes into our life because we're putting something we shouldn't ahead of what we should. So we're like, God, I don't know why right now I don't feel your presence and everything. I'm just confused. I don't know what you're doing in the Spirit. We probably just got our priorities wrong. But when He becomes first again and worship and time with Him, all of a sudden we hear Him again. There He is. He never left. I am counseling people about their relationships. And it just seems to kind of keep coming from, from every direction. What I want you to know tonight, church, is this right here. I said all that to say this. We have got to put ourselves in a position with God in time spent with Him that we don't get deceived and that we hear clear and we don't get confused. But we know what the Father is doing. Amen. Listen to me. Because the moment you believe that your life, your job, your God, your church, your spouse, your child, or anything else is not the right thing, the right one, or whatever, you will do, you will change it. The church must not be confused. We must be clear, clear-minded, hearing the Father. Amen. Come on, church, help me. I'm telling you as honest and humble as I can, Tyler, there are times that I don't feel God in a sense of in the flesh or something any more than Scooby-Doo does. But my faith is based on His Word. And it never moves. I don't have to feel Him. He's with me. Things don't have to go perfect. He's with me.
church, we got we got to become established. And we can't be moved by everything. We, we got to be who we say we are and we got to do what we say we'll do. You know what I mean? We just got to be the church. Amen. But Father, so I was thinking about been counseling a young lady whose heart broken, whose husband left her. I'm just going to say it. Um, do you know what it's like to talk to a young lady with uh, two children? who desperately loves her husband, he looks her in the face and says, I don't love you. Now some people think it's spiritual, but it's callous in my book when you can look her back in the face like it don't matter. Well, I've had it happen to me. And I thank God it did. Because I know how much it matters. I know what my life was like. I know what my kid's life was like. I'm very passionate about marriage. Passionate. I know how the devil can paint a picture to lead people into something that don't turn out like they thought, but you can't go back. Church, we're living in a day right now where these things are happening every day, everywhere. Now, if you could hear me and hear my heart, I am telling you that nothing is ever perfect and some things do need fixing. But how many in here tonight believe that God can fix everything? I do. I believe that. That's why we pray for these, the sick. That's why we pray for these things. Well, how about your finances, your relationships, everything? I believe He can heal it all. <coughs> Bible said in the last days in Matthew, I, I'm sorry, in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Know this, in the last days, men will be lovers of pleasures, lovers of self more than lovers of God. He said, know this, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Listen to me. If we're not already on the edge of perilous times, I don't know what, where we're at. Now listen to me, this is not condemnation. I'm trying to... I want you to leave here tonight going, you know what? We're going to win this. Amen. We're going to win. There's very few families that are not facing some type of tragedy, some type of situation, something that we don't need God to severely intervene on our behalf. Some people, you know, I think, you know, some years and years ago, one uh, preacher said that... uh, one translation says that that's uh, in 2 Timothy 3 1 it says dangerous opportunities. Well, opportunities that have danger associated with them is a good way to say it. But here's what I want to tell you is because when things, here's my point, and I'm going to move on my, my message, is that when life gets tough and the things in the natural and in this country and in the world, and we're in, we're in that incubator right now. Listen. Because that will happen, many people will turn inward to take care of their self and even deny the power of God that can actually take care of the situation. They will begin. It ain't all just about when we usually preach it, we say things like this. Men will start doing what they want to do. It's more hunting and fishing and women will... No, no. Whatever you have to do to survive, you'll begin to believe that is your answer instead of looking to God. If we're going to serve Him, we need to believe Him. Y'all know what I'm saying? Come on, y'all. Come on. He's either our God or He's not. Come on, we're the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's our Father. He's our Father. He's got a plan. Hallelujah. He's got purpose. He's got power. He's in control. 
I mean, when we submit to him, he's in full control of our lives. He is, over, he is watching over us and performing everything we need him to. Father's taking good care of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Marsh and I bought this house. Just a little thing popped in my head for an example because we all live it. Marsh and I bought that house and we knew we was going to have to do some work to it. But we was hoping that the air conditioner unit in the hallway, that it would work and, and uh, we wouldn't have to buy a new air conditioner unit, which is a big investment. So the people that we bought the house from right before we signed on it and everything told us, said, yeah, it's back working. Everything's fine. Okay, praise God. Hallelujah. And so when we got the house, we found out it wasn't working. Hallelujah. So we had a technician come out. <clears throat> had a technician come out and he, he, he uh, evaluated it and everything, found the copper line that went into the attic and everything that, uh, that the oil goes up into. There was two places wasn't soldered properly on that unit. The oil had leaked back down into the furnace. If it had been winter and we'd have cut it on, it'd have burned our house down. I said, God is good. cost us a few thousand dollars but daddy's already gave us that God is good you could be in the middle of that and go we got to buy a new air conditioner too I mean no thank God our family's safe thank you father for showing us what we couldn't see with our natural eyes it's all in how you want to see it it's your opportunity to see God in it. Hallelujah. All right, let's see if we can go somewhere in 27.5 minutes. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 29. If you could pull that up for me, I ain't going to try to quote it. I got it, but no, I want them to be able to see it. <clears throat> for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <clears throat> Last week I said, these words are basically up here. To foreknow means to, know, uh, to see ahead of time. It doesn't mean just to see, it means to consider or to know ahead of time. So those that God did know before time, he knew you intimately before time. The Bible says we know this before you're formed in your mother's womb. He knew you. Amen. So what I wanted everybody the light to come on and, and for us to really start pressing into was this, is when you close your eyes, you can say, Father, you knew me before I was ever made. I said he knew me. He knew you. Listen, he didn't care what flesh package he put you in, he knew you. Amen. That's your spirit man. That's who you will be for eternity. He saw you. He knew you. You came out of him. That is amazing to me when you consider it and think how that those he did foreknow that he knew ahead of time. It says he did predestinate. Amen? Predestinate. It's two words. Pro, aridzo. Pro means before. Aridzo means to mark the boundaries or give the limits. So what I was telling you last week is, is that God already knew your potential. That's exciting to me because I heard Miles Monroe say some 25, 30 years ago, he said this, he said, he said the, Wealthiest place in the world is the cemetery. Because most of the people laying out there never even used or tapped into the treasure that God put in them. So what I'm trying to encourage you, you know, not be negative, is that if you literally ask God, Father, what did you plan for me ahead of time since you knew me? Amen? Amen? Listen, I'll, I'm not going to get off that that easy. 
because you can't let it go that easy. You're driving down the road. I'm just trying to put you in the picture. I'm driving down the road, and I'm hungry, and I want a shower, and I've been working, and I'm tired, and I'm driving down the road, and I say, man, I'm sick of doing this every day. And Father's sitting up in heaven going, if you only knew what I knew about you. So when you get in the presence of God, when you get in your time alone with Him in your prayer closet, in your intimate place, and you get with the Father, listen, at that moment in your truck, in your car, why don't you just start saying to yourself or to your everyday blah, blah life, why don't you say, Father God, I thank you for revealing what you already knew about me from the beginning. Show me who I really am. Let me achieve or do what you really want me to do. Listen to me. When we're called, for example, to the ministry, you don't wake up on Monday morning feeling like an evangelist, pastor, teacher, apostle, prophet, or anything. You feel like another man getting out of bed on Monday morning. When you're under attack or you're just going through life, there are days where the enemy will tell you you're none of that and all the negative just like he tells you. All I'm telling you, I'm trying to paint a picture that every one of us in ministry or not, every one of us, which we all have a ministry, have got to remind ourselves, God knew me before I was sent to this earth and he predetested. He predetermined ahead of time things about me. And I need to know what those... I need to remember that. I need to remind myself that God is the one who determined who I'd be and what I'd do. Ain't my circumstances of where I live in life or what family I'm from. It's why God brought you here. Hallelujah. He predestinated us to be conformed into the image of His Son. He predetermined ahead of time and He's the one that set the mark in the boundaries. What are the mark in the boundaries? That we can be conformed to the image of His Son. (coughs) That's pretty awesome. Amen? Hallelujah. Conformed. We talked about it last week. It's uh, this word right here. Some more folks. And that word right there, we get the word symphony and stuff like that from it. Uh, It means to, uh, listen, it means having the same form or becoming similar to be fashioned exactly like another. How how do y'all like that right there? That where we stop so short sometime of thinking we're men, women, you know, children of God... I just like the word sons of God because it sounds gender specific. And I ain't talking about new, you know, this culture. I'm talking about in general, if you're a lady, and I keep saying sons of God, I don't want you to think I'm not including you. We're all sons of God. Sons literally just means those mature or fully developed. Amen? So he said right here that God determined ahead of time that we could all be conformed into the same image of His Son. And that, church, is why it is very negative for Christians to say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That is not a humble statement. That is almost blasphemy. You are not anymore. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation. You are a new living being of the Father. You are not a sinner. You may be a new creation that sometimes sin. It does not change the fact that you've been born again which changed your DNA. If we could ever really embrace that mindset that when I got born again filled with the Spirit of God I became a different creature. (coughs) Amen. 
So here's all I'm trying to tell you. That God determined ahead of time that we could be conformed into the image of His Son that we might be the firstborn. That He might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want to touch on that a second. Listen to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just what I wrote. This is telling us that Jesus was the pattern and God wants to bring us into the same image or manifestation of that pattern. Amen. It's what that's telling us. Here's a statement for you. Father God wants to duplicate Jesus in you. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus now wants us to be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Now let's go across the internet and people will be trying to kill me from New York tomorrow. That's fine. That's the truth. As scripture says, he wants us to be conformed into the image of his dear son. Listen, why? Listen to this. It's powerful. Because when you do, that doesn't make him the last. That makes him the firstborn among many just like him. If some of us don't ever get to that point where we're walking in that image, he'll remain the only one, not the firstborn. Such great potential there. Go to verse 30. Moreover, how do you like, how do you like Paul? He was terrible. He just threw out all that steak on the table and said, chew on that. And then he said, and more than that. <laughs> Whom he did predetermine and set the boundaries, and those are his son, them he also called. Uh-oh. Hallelujah. Go down to it. Skip it a bunch of my stuff, but I might come back to it. The word called is the word kaleo. Now listen to this. It literally means to be given an invitation. Do y'all remember with the feast? Jesus told a parable and he said there was a rich man he prepared a feast. He sent his servants out to bid those to come. And when they went, one said, look, I got to go back home and I got to take care of my cattle and I got I to do this, I got to do that. And they wouldn't come. He said, now go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Just ask whoever now. This is the same verbiage. God has given us an invitation. Every one of us. It's not regulated to just one of us, one special person. He's compelling us all to come in. And those whom He called, He also justified. Do you know what that means? Everybody in here probably has heard the word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Here's what he's saying. He has given us all a personal invitation. And because he gave you an invitation, he don't care what you look like when you get there. You are qualified for this because he justified you. You know what keeps us out and at the door instead of in his presence and being transformed? is our believing we're unworthy. It's our sin consciousness, our condemnation. It's our believing I'm not that spiritual. It's our believing I don't really know the Bible. It's all those things when Father's saying, but I gave you the invitation. Why don't you just come on in? 
I called you. And if I called you, God, I justified you. I said, he's with me. That's good even on Wednesday night, I can tell you that. Hallelujah. Then he said something else. Those he called, he also glorified. Doxazo, it's a verb. Listen to this. It means to, to think or to conclude, to come to a resolution or, or an opinion about something. And that decision is that someone or something is worthy of praise. They qualify for honor. They're splendid. They are wonderful. That's what glorified means. Father is saying that when you and I come to the Lord with a pure heart, he don't care where you've been or what you've done. He don't care anything about any of that. If he has called you, he justified you. And if he justified you, he's fixing to glorify you. Jerry, come up here and let, let me show you glorification. Just stand beside me. Take my hand. This is glorification. Jerry just came to the Father because Father called him. Jerry didn't let his past or nothing stop him. He came and gave him his life. He began to worship him and say, hey, why? Because he realized that no matter what's in his past, God justified him. God said, that's my boy. Now what, look what he does. He glorifies him. Here's what he does. He takes him throughout and he goes, hey, John, this is Jerry. This is my son. This is Jerry. This is Jerry right here. Hey, Miss Phyllis, this is Jerry. He begins to display you to the world. He begins to display you in the spirit. You think I'm crazy probably. But I'm not crazy. Because he puts us on display. Amen. He wants the world to see his son again. He wants the light of his son to shine through you. He don't want the bushel to cover up the light. He wants the devil and all his cohorts to say, Have you considered Job? Have you considered Jerry? Go watch him. He looks just like me. He's looking for some people who won't come short of being able to be glorified for his glory, not for ours. For his glory. In all situations, Father, you can use me. Why? Because I know you called me. Now I don't care if the whole world turns against me. You've justified me. And if you justified me, you'll glorify me. Because you want the world to see your son in me. Pretty powerful. I just wrote this to condense it all. It said, God beforehand had determined that he could send Jesus who would grow and mature into full sonship and be his express full image in the earth. Once Jesus did that, he became the example, the template that is able to be duplicated in us. God not only had a marvelous plan, but he sent out an invitation to everyone. And whosoever will let them will come unto him. Not only did God call you, he gave you the invitation, but he also justified you. He made you just as pure and holy and worthy of honor and qualified as anyone to be in his presence. Not only did he qualify you and adorn us, wrap us in the proper attire of a robe of righteousness so that we could come into his private meeting with those closest to him, but he also glorified us. He made us worthy of being bragged on, talked about, honored, and valued 
in his kingdom. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Don't let this world, don't let the attacks, don't let anything stop you in your transformation from who you once were into His express image in the earth. It doesn't come just by, listen to me, coming into His presence when our heart turns to the Lord. It's truly our desire and our passion from His glory, from His manifested presence, we're changed into the same image. When the trials come, the testings, the problems come, it is not woe is you, you're being attacked. It is praise God, it's my opportunity. It's my opportunity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I only got a couple minutes. But one of the things I skipped, maybe I shouldn't go there tonight. So that was pretty good. I better stop there. My wife said, you can cut it short, baby. She gave me the okay earlier today. That's a good, good word. She knows me. I'll try to give you all everything to the last second. Hallelujah. All right. I hope you get encouragement out of it. Stop letting your past, stop letting your current situation Make you think that God can't do something incredible with you, for you, in you right now. He can. 